We were talking about we were talking about last seeing each other, which was on uh, on tour with. Uh, I was playing with Cynic, and you That's came cool. out to the show, which was very exciting for me to meet you for the first time and to hang out a little bit. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun watching you guys play, and I, I remember I brought the kids, and we yeah. all hung out. It was, uh, it's a fun time. Long time ago, though. Gosh, that was what year? That was two thousand. Yeah. I think early. in nine or ten. Oh, okay, 2009 or 10, okay. I think so. Yeah. So I, I think for most of the people who are watching this, they will be probably familiar with you because of my past and your past. They kind of overlap with uh, with Cynic. Absolutely. But yeah, but for those of you, uh, for those of the viewers who are not aware, uh, Jason is a fellow guitar player, musician, uh, most widely known for his work in, uh, in Cynic, of course. And then, uh, yeah, you also play with Monstrosity and uh, with Gordian Knot. And yeah, I, th I think as a consequence of you being kind of in the early version of Cynic, kind of pre-internet era, and then later uh, Cynic getting reunited with me in there and blah, blah, blah. Um, you are a little bit like behind the scenes, so to speak. Like you are not, you, you've never been really in the spotlight f too much. Yeah. And and yeah. so a lot of people don't know too much about you, I think. Like at, at least not as much uh, as they know about Paul, for example, of Cynic. And sure. um, so I think that leaves open like a lot of questions uh, that I want to ask and that I'm just very curious about. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about your musical like upbringing, your your past, and just what happened be, before you kind of um, became a professional musician with with Cynic. Um, was always into music, you know. Was always into music. Had young young uh, parents, so my my mother was always playing music, and um, I have a, have an older brother, and he around twelve years old picked up the bass. And so I was already into music, and so he picked up the bass, and so uh, next thing you know, I wanted to play guitar, and so that's how, you know, I got brought into it. It was just, I don't know, by chance, I just always loved music. I just, yeah, so from there, I just started playing. I had one lesson. I had a guy come out, and uh, he taught me some open chords. He taught me a major and a blues scale, and uh, the two jobber bar chords, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that was my only lesson that I had until I was eight years old. So yeah, until like junior high. So I played by ear. I just learned stuff, listened to stuff. And, um, and then junior high I took a guitar class. But by that time I was already much more advanced than the kids in the class. So it was like just a practice session for me. It really, I really didn't learn that much in there. And, um, so I was just always an ear player. So, you know, from there, junior high, I got into a couple high school bands, you know, the, the garage bands and played the battle bands at the schools and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And um, and that was mostly in the, the more classic rock, metal, Ozzy Osbourne, like, you know, mm -hmm. like that type of uh, genre. Um, but then around 16, started getting into heavier um 16, 17, started getting into heavier music, started listening to a lot of heavier music and um, just got bored on the guitar uh, with all the classic and, you know, was looking for something more and it was faster, it was more aggressive. And so I just started playing and um, and that was it until after I had met Paul and Sean and actually joined Cynic. My, my brother was in a band. He was playing a keg party. And back in the day, they would just get an open field. They'd put a stage. They'd get a couple kegs of beer. A bunch of people would come out, pay five bucks to get in, put 15 bands up or five bands, 10 bands up, you know. So um, Cynic was actually on stage before my brother's band. Mm. Um, just however the line, back, you know, it didn't matter back then. Um, and... It's funny when when they were getting off stage and my brother was getting on stage, my brother said, "Hey, you guys need a guitarist. My my younger brother loves that pissed off music like you guys play." And they said, "Actually, we do need a, a guitarist." So, after the gig, my brother introduced me to Paul and Sean. From there we talked and I um 
ended up going out and we jammed and ended up joining the band. And then after that, we were still right before college. So then when we hit college age, that's when I actually first went and did any studies, real legitimate studies musically. But I was never good at it, man. My theory sucks. I, I can't <laughs> sight read, you know. I mean, I can read, but, you know, I have to work it out and all that. And my problem, I think, was was growing up, I was such an ear player that if you gave me a sheet of music, I could figure it out. But mm -hmm. as soon as I can play the first four notes, I'll never read that sheet again. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll just remember it, you know? So I never really got good at any of the theory. and um, But love different styles of music. So it was always exploring different styles, trying to play different styles. And, and, and of course, the... Um, it was about a year and a half in college. It was just some, uh, I took some jazz courses and theory and ear training and stuff like that. And that, that did make that really brought into horizons for me musically. Um, but besides that, it's just always kind of play what I hear, you know, and I can kind of bounce between different feels or different styles, but uh, I'm in no way a educated musician like, like yourself, you know what I mean? As far as, um, well, well that's actually, that's music. very interesting to me. And I, um, I wouldn't really consider myself, well, I am educated, but, um, I do have like a very uh, similar, like upbringing musically as, as you do. So oh, really? uh, yeah, yeah. So for the, for the longest time, I was also very much just an intuitive ear player as well. And also someone who learned like most of, of my playing just by uh, teaching myself, basically, you know, but just by listening to music, copying music. And that was just also the time that Internet kind of kicked off, you know, when I was learning guitar. So I could find a lot of like theory and stuff on there. But um, so you're primarily self-taught as well. I am. Yeah. And it was until much later uh, that I decided to, to kind of study music and even then um it took me quite a, a bit to sort out like what exactly i wanted to study because back then we kind of in holland at least we had like uh, your classical conservatories and your jazz conservatories and it was pretty clear that it was not going to be classical but jazz you know as as much as we're both into jazz i think we're both not traditional classic jazz players right like much more from the yeah, much yeah. more from the fusion kind of school thing. And um, so I was kind of like, um, I was not sure what to do. And I did like a lot of, um, or a lot, I did a bunch of, uh, how do you call these things, where you go to play to, to like an entry exam, basically. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, yeah, the jazz conservatories were like, well, you know, you're kind of proficient technically, but you don't know shit about your, you know, about traditional play. jazz. And I wanted to play with like distortion, everything. Well, that, that was not a good idea either. Um, yeah. And so then I ended up doing this uh, music production slash composition study. And that was excellent because they were a little bit more open to to people who were not like necessarily very schooled, um, you know, with music theory. And they just took the time to welcome pretty much everyone who showed they had some amount of talent, I guess. And um, and so there I kind of learned, the, you know, kind of the, the basics of, of uh, and, and also kind of a little bit more advanced of, of, of music theory. But still, what is interesting to me is like to this day, I do know the, the music theory, but I also always have to make this translation move in my head from my, you know, self-taught period to how, you know, normal, normally educated music people think and reason. So, um, yeah, so I can relate on, on that level, you know, and, and definitely still, um, yeah, again, like even though I can kind of reason my way into analyzing something, you know, on, on the guitar or whatever. Um, that's always like a second thought. I'm right, the intuitive right. it's part is first. It's first. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, my, I, was, I was never really academically inclined. I was never a great student. And, you know, so it was, um, it was just all just hear it and play it. And I would just start to figure out where those, those notes were. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, 
it's always been the ear. I always have said, you know, if it sounds good, if it sounds right, then, you know, it's okay. And I guess you, you I guess you got to somewhat naturally have to have an ear to be able to, to do that. But um, for example, there was a, a solo I did on the Focus album. Um, I don't remember what solo it was, but Sean Malone comes up to me and he goes, so um, he goes, in your solo, he goes, you played a, I don't know, a, you know, a, a, a B flat, whatever, mm -hmm. C or A, whatever note. And I go, okay, not knowing any clue what he was talking about. He goes, it's not even in the key signature of the song. He goes, why'd you play? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I go, it sounded good. He goes, it's brilliant. He goes, I would have never thought of it. You know what I mean? Or whatever. And I go, and so that's how I've really based all my music. If, if it sounds right in my ear, I go with it. And fortunately, it seems like... Um, it's worked, you know, most yeah. of the time when I present some music to someone or if I'm working with someone, um, they seem to, to seem to like it. Reiner used to say, he said, you play what's appropriate for that piece of music you're working on. Uh, yeah, it was an appropriate, mm -hmm. player, something like that. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's funny. I don't even, I'm working with a, another band out of, um, Germany. And so they send me the, the tracks and it's a bass and bass and drum track. So I put it on and I start playing through it. It's first thing I do is just start playing through and get a feel. I'm going to write the guitar tracks for the song. And, um, and I go, Oh, you know what? Let me, let me ask him. So I sent him a message, send me the key signature and the, the time signature. And, um, Oh, it's beats per minute and time signature, bro. The time signature is like four, four. It was like, Four four seven four eight four seven four eight four ten four uh, eight four ten four eight four. You know, it was like this crazy. Mm -hmm. So you know, my eyes crossed. <laughs> I closed the message, put the phone, <laughs> and I just play. <laughs> you yeah. know, I was playing. I, it doesn't even matter what time signature it is. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just feel my way through the music is how I've always done it. So definitely a very unorthodox player and um, unorthodox upbringing in music like yourself yeah it, it's so interesting to me that like a lot of there's this whole like thing people often talk about when when they say like well if you know theory then it's going to either limit you or it's going to instruct you like you know blah 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 I have many opinions about that but w what's interesting to me is that a lot of people need I think a, a little bit of like theory to get exposed to new sounds, if you will, especially yeah. if it's if it's about like out there kind of exotic sounds. But then now even, you know, every now and then you have those players such as yourself who seem to just have an ear for those like out there sounds with, without any training. And I find that very interesting. And I would say yeah. like, for instance, there we are a little different because like, back in my self self-taught period i did like go through endless like scales you know just like pictures of scales i found on the internet and all that stuff and, right. and from there i kind of trained my own ear but i think you have a little bit of a different approach where you just literally just heard it like on the spot yeah um, it's 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 and i'm not i'm not a a great improvisational player either in that sense um but when i write music it's it's almost like the the music tells me what to write you know it, it, i just need the first couple notes and it'll it'll kind of lead me the rest of the way it just mm. i just hear it and um and i, I agree I, i'm also of that thought that that the theory is only there for a guideline but its rules are meant to be broken you know so mm. i think that with me as a musician the lack of theory and education i have I have no rules in my playing. I don't care. I'll approach it any way. I'll, you know, I always take different approaches and it's just, again, what I hear. It's just trying to find what I'm hearing on the guitar. And then after playing, doing that for many years, a lot of times my hand just kind of goes there now at mm. this point. But, um, but yeah, yeah, it, it, I, I do, I do, I really do think I come across or I approach music a bit different than a lot of people. And I think that that's probably what has helped me as an artist in a sense that at least people say I have a certain sound to my playing, you know, well, that's yeah, maybe you do. I, I approach things differently. So I think it's a benefit for me. 
Mm-hmm. It's intimidating. It's, you know, in, in the sense of going and playing with people, and I'm sure you've experienced it, that are educated mm-hmm. and are killer players, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a little different, you know. For sure. Yeah, yeah. And, um, well, it's actually interesting that you, you know, bring that up that you have, um, how did you just say that you have your own sound? Well, I, I would be the first one to definitely agree with that. Like you have a very distinct sound. And I think I'm probably in the best position of anyone like to judge that because of that period where I joined Cynic and I kind of had to learn your parts. And right. that was, you know, I was a huge fan of Cynic. So I did a lot of listening and kind of transcribing before I joined, but it was always kind of a mystery to me as to what parts came from you and what parts came from Paul. It just sounded like one big mysterious kind of thing. But then- did that, did that even out as you started playing the, the Focus well, album with, with well, them? Yeah, that really gave me, because at that point, Paul sent me those stems so I could actually hear which parts right. were yours and which parts were Paul's. And that's when I really found out, like, aha, it's like Paul was much more responsible in general, I guess, for the more traditional almost sounding harmonies and melodies. And you were kind of responsible for the really out there angular type of alien -y you know, almost alien-like weird stuff. And I found that so interesting to see how those two elements combined into the sound right. that is that album, that is Focus. And um, also curious, yeah, and, and, and curiously, yeah. I think that is also like one of the biggest difference you hear between the album that I was on and you were on, um, or and Focus, is that you are not on that second album. So you really, for me, if, if I listen to that album from the mindset of, of an old fan of the band, I really miss that kind of mysterious type of alien quality to the music. Interesting. And, and you know, it, it was never really intentional like that. Um, but it's funny, I, I was going through... Um, again, I've said it many times, there's a budget, but I'm going to make it happen. Uh, but I was going through some of the video footage that I have of Cynic. I, I, I would like to um, like to make a documentary and, and put that out. Nice. But um, it's funny, in there, Scott was giving me a hard time. He's like, bro, you wrote all the crazy shit. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, I, like, I, I wrote the beginning of uh, I'm But A Wave. That's pretty and simple. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, or whatever. And he's like, no, dude, you're playing all the weird shit or... So I didn't realize that, I, and um, but I guess I do. I definitely can go outside into that realm. I mean, you know, I, I love classic playing. I love Motown, and I love the groove and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, I do also like to go out. I, I like to hear um, just things going on in different in different directions, and mm -hmm. uh, and then combining to make an interesting sound. But uh, that's interesting that you noticed that. And I think, um, no disrespect to anybody that's played after me with Cynic, but I think you were the, the best guitarist. And I've seen a few, uh, I've seen, what, I think a couple shows, two, maybe three shows. So it was different guitarists mm. uh, playing my parts. But you, by far, played them the most accurately. Well, thank no, you. <laughs> no one seems to play right. And then I guess uh, Sean told me, Reinhardt told me once, he said that everybody had a hard time with my picking style. For sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, so, we even had a word for it. Like I, I remember Sean and I, when we talked about it many times, and I, I called it like evil Jason picking, something like that. Because <laughs> indeed, like there, there was something... Um, you know, for the musicians out there who are listening to this, they probably know like that typical 16th note, ticka, 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 like two notes at the same time. Like that's such a cynic thing to do. You know, like you guys almost like trademark, tra trademark, how do you say that? Copyrighted that like sound to me. And um, yeah, and, and what I find interesting from a technical perspective is like Paul had was very good at it and he's still very good at it, but he has a very like stiff kind of more metal hand to do it. He's like a, he's like an arm player. Exactly, you know, like, exactly. Arm, I'm a wrist player. Exactly, you know? and I noticed that. And what's interesting is that most people who have a more loose type, funky type approach, they lack a certain type of, of um, 
accuracy when it comes to metal riffing, but you didn't. You were still incredibly precise, which I could hear in those stems, you know, when you hear them isolated. It was so right. well played. And uh, yeah, you definitely gave me a challenge, you know, it, especially actually, it's funny that you just uh, mentioned the uh, I'm But A Wave 2 song, because that, like I would, every night we would play that song, I would not be looking forward to playing that like, um, that clean part that you like uh, alternate. I think we even like I asked you to play it when we met in real life uh, on that tour. And I think I didn't remember it or something like that. It's been so long, right? Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> yeah. like, damn, I wish I could have shared more with with Timon, but I haven't. You know, I really haven't played those songs since um, I played those songs with the band. Yeah, makes sense. That, and we did it so so intensely for the touring and all that stuff that, you know, it's like, you know how it is after a long tour. It's like, okay, let me take a break. Let me play something different, you know? But, yeah, for um, sure. I, I think I forgot most of it as well at this point. Yeah, yeah. But it's mm. interesting, I guess, with my picking hand, you know, you've got your traditional picking and mm -hmm. then you've got your, your plucking. And then, so instead of playing, which I use a pick, but I do also use my fingers. Mm. So it depends on just what sound I need or... Uh, or whatever, but I didn't realize, and it was mentioned a couple times to me that yeah, it was the picking hand seemed to be a challenge for some players. For sure, so it's it's yeah, it's just again, it's usually you people have a lot of accuracy when they kind of tense up, and then there's a threshold, certain threshold of speed that when you go over that, you need to just have your movement become more loose. But usually, it becomes also less accurate, you know, in terms of like you get more noises, it's less clean. And yeah. you, you figured out a way to, to do that incredibly accurate while being loose. Very cool. I think I just played a lot of both styles, you know, like, like I said, I love groove, you know, I love Motown, I love, you know, um, so even even on some of the it's funny. I used to with with Reiner, you know, in between the songs, we would just like groove out and hit some funky grooves, and you know. So I think I, I have a soft, you know, I have, I have a supple wrist. But then having to play the metal and having to, you know, get at it and like, geez, playing with monstrosity and stuff like that, those guys are like speed demons and you know, and accuracy and all that. So I think it's just because I played them both so much styles. But there is. Mm -hmm. It's definitely interesting, you know, like with the more fusion I play, going from a heavy, fast riff to a, a funkier, groovier riff, uh, riff, it's definitely, it's it's a it's a feel and a mindset that has to change in your playing. Mm. And you have to be able to pop from, you know, like from metal to a jazz to a groove to that not only, it, it doesn't only change on the, on the neck, you know, I think it changes more in the hand feel, you know, so... Mm. Um, that's something I just, I think I've been always been able to do is kind of pop through feels rhythmically playing, you know? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I'm uh, also trying to keep an eye here at the chat that I uh, have on my other screens and I see some oh, this is live. Is anyone watching? Yeah. There's some people here. Um, 16 viewers right now so there <laughs> anyway so let me quickly just uh read these uh, i think most of them are um are uh towards you so someone is asking you why did you choose steinberger guitars that question is directed towards jason and yourself oh so for both of us so why did you well me um when i Went to college for that that year and a half or so. My uh, guitar teacher had a Stein. Actually, he had Paul's Stein. He sold it to Paul. Which one? Uh, that one that was uh, all kind of colored oh, green. That one. The yeah, yeah. Splatter one, uh, I think Special the one he used one. On the tour with us. Yeah, the with Focus. Um, so we would take lessons and he would let me play the Stein. We'd switch guitars and he'd let me play it. And I'd be like, dude, this thing just plays incredible. Sounds great. And, um, so, um, so Paul ended up buying it. I didn't have the money to buy it. And, and I don't like the middle pickup. I'm a two pickup guy. It gets mm -hmm. in between my, my picking hand. It, it bothers me. So, um, but actually Chris Kringle, the bass player that played on portal worked at a music store in Milwaukee and just a little bit after the, the recording of focus and we were about to go on tour 
He goes, he called me up. He goes, bro, someone just walked into my store, handed me a, a Stein and wants $600 for it. Mm. I said, bro, I'll take it. He says, no, no, no. It's already in the mail. He says, if anyone saw this guitar, they would have grabbed it. So he says he grabbed it. He put it right in a box, put it in UPS, UPS it to me and then <laughs> called me. It's on the way. Oh, wow. um, if you don't like it, I'll take it back and I'll make some money on it. But if you want, I'll sell it to you for 600 bucks. So that's how I ended up getting, getting my Stein. But yeah, I, I just got to play it from my, uh, my guitar teacher and just really loved the feel. I loved the, um, the convenience, you know, the, the, the headstock. Uh, I just recently fixed my extra up and just the extra headstock. I'm banging into stuff everywhere with it. I'm not <laughs> been playing with the Stein for so long. Yeah, but right. um, the durability, the convenience, you know, if a string pops, it's super quick to fix. Uh, on tour, that thing was it was in a soft case, but it flew out of my um, bunk a couple times when the bus, you know, wobbled. You pick it up, bing, 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 ready to go. I mean, they're just solid guitars. So um, playing on uh, on my uh, guitar teachers, I really fell in love with the guitar. And then I'm, I'm not a big uh, gear guy. I'm kind of a minimalist guy. Mm. So, um, so I've just had that guitar. That's what I've played for years. I have my extra, which I just set up now. So I, I literally just have two electric guitars. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite Very, minimal. If you can't make it with two guitars. And I mean, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you on that. Like, especially, well, I've, I've always been kind of minimalist as well, but especially lately, the last couple of years, I shrunk down and, well, I kind of went this whole route that I went for Telecasters. I don't know if you followed that. And and so now I only play tellies. And, oh, uh, okay. Interesting. I noticed you've only been playing Telecasters. It's funny, my brother, <clears throat> and um, it, just in case he ever watches this, just let me say, screw you, bro. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 1967 Telecaster. This thing was absolutely beautiful in mint condition. I was about 12 years old, and we both used to ride uh, dirt bikes and ATCs, and he wanted to buy a new ATC, and he was $150 short. And I told him, John, give me a week. I'll come up with the money. Please give me a week. And the next day, he sold that thing for $150. Years <laughs> later, I saw one. Same year, beat to hell, going for five grand. And who cares oh, about crap. the money? The, the sound, the play, I mean, just beautiful guitar. So, yeah, John, screw you um, <laughs> for selling it. I sell them every time it comes up because I would still own that damn guitar. They're beautiful guitars. I love them, yeah. Um, yeah, a little bit about to if I answer that question. And yeah. I think it was mostly because I was such a big fan of you guys, of, of Cynic. And then... Oh, it, and also, of course, Alan Holdsworth, who, yeah. yeah, he played some of them, but mostly this, at least when I was listening a lot to him, he was playing this copy kind of of a Steinberger, so yeah, custom made yeah. thing. Um, and I, yeah, right. And um, I don't know about you, but I was also just attracted to the fact that they weren't like very standard looking, you know, just, and I, I think, I mean, you guys were also, of course, into kind of a, strange style of music overall so i, I think that goes I also that, you know with with weirder guitar shapes or something it was just random i think you know it's mm. just random that, that it happened I, I mean i have to say as soon as i got the guitar and i played it not only all the playing factors of it but that the small the the little case easy to carry around yeah. get on a plane you know it's just that was another big thing, you know, that was definitely yeah. another. Same for but, me, uh, because especially in the beginning when I was still living in uh, in Europe and we were flying over a lot, that was super easy to just put that thing in your overhead locker and... Uh, not and worry about it. Yeah. And, and also, like you said, I remember on tour, for example, some we did some winter tours where it was like in, in the back of the trailer being super cold, like, you know, driving through the snow, we would enter a venue, you would take the guitar out and it would get all conden condensation, or how do you say that? When yeah, it gets like wet, which yeah. was always scary to see, but then it still like just, you know, stayed in tune and performed pretty well. So that was indeed a cool. Same experience in Poland. Um, it was really cold when we were playing over there on tour. And yeah, you would have to, what, what they would tell us to do is, is open the guitar, expose it, close it for a minute or two, open it, expose it, mm. 
close it until it adjusted from the temperature change from uh, outside to the, to the gig. I makes remember sense. Having, I was never that careful, but <laughs> yeah, but, but that's the thing. They were so durable. I don't think it really would have mattered with the Stein. Those things are, you know, I mean, geez, I've been playing this one for almost, it's probably been 25, 30 years or something now. 20, 25. I mean, how old's the Cynic album? You know, that's how long yeah. I've been playing. Stein. Yeah, indeed. And it, still, and actually, um, funny story. The last solo on the Gordian knot album had a big, big bend, you know, and I was over at Malone's and I was recording the solo, recording the solo, hit the, the band and broke the whole tremolo off the, the Stein. And I was like, did you, did you get that? He's like, I got it. I was like, okay, that's <laughs> what we're keeping this. Um, not doing any more bends today. It didn't break the actual bridge, but the, I ripped the whole arm off of it. So I actually had to replace mm. that. But I mean, if you think about how much abuse I put on that guitar, even in the focus playing and, you know, all the yeah, dive stuff. Dive stuff. <laughs> insanely durable guitars could you find some replacement parts because it's kind of hard to yeah, find. yeah I mean, it, was, it was long enough ago and i actually found a original stein you know bridge just like i had trans trim bridge they were expensive japan, right out of japan expensive yep yeah. I, I don't remember at the time how much but i think it's 400 500 bucks something like that mm. um and i found it out of japan and they shipped it to me i was amazed and i got it and hmm. and put it back on and we're back back to go yeah you you had one of those trans trams right the, like the luxurious yep. time model yeah yeah that's just and, a, and they're great i mean you bend your chords it stays yeah. in key and tune and you know it's just uh yeah that's some um, amazing technology that hasn't really been as far as i know at least hasn't been done by someone else it's uh so for, for those of you who don't know it's like it's quite an ingenious little system where if you push down your tremolo or pull it up all notes go out of tune at the same amount so whole whole chords you can bend down and upwards which gives this very like very different feeling from doing that on a different style uh, tremolo, oh, right that, yeah and, and actually, they're, because they are no longer available, there are a couple guys out there that are making a similar type mm -hmm. uh, type trams trim. Because there's, a, I, I'm part of, I think on Facebook, I have this like a Steinberger group or something that mm. that I'm a, that I get you know flashes from. But yeah, there's you can't. The problem is you can't find parts for them anymore. You know, so if it goes now, you have to go to something else. So I think there's, I think there's one company that's doing a very similar bridge to that original trans mm. trim. Well, it makes sense uh, d d with, especially considering how much these headless guitars. Well, I wanted to say came back, but it's almost like how they finally really got popular. You know, and right. It's kind of funny to me that I, I don't know how it was back in your day because that's a little earlier. But when I was playing those things, like. Almost everyone would hate those guitars, you know, they would maybe find them interesting to watch or whatever. But like most people who would say something about it would say something negative about it, about how it looks. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think just for so many years, people have seen headstocks on guitars and it it, yeah. it bothered people. I do remember that, you know, yeah. and I'm like, I could give a crap, man. This thing plays <laughs> all the time. It's convenient. You keep your big old headstock, you know, yeah, right. So and, um, and it's isn't funny, it's, with my actor, I almost want to take the headstock off because I'm just banging <laughs> it everywhere now, you know? Yeah, I definitely had that as well in the beginning with uh, when I was starting to play normal guitars again. But um, it, it's funny, right? Like how then later on they became so so popular, like in a certain scene, I guess. But still, like, you know, there's uh, you see them everywhere now in this kind of broader technical style. Uh, yeah. And I, I wonder why they took back off or, um, or or finally got popular or maybe people finally got used to the look or I, I don't know. Yeah, not sure. Um, it's, it's because I think that Brand Strandberg was kind of, if I remember correctly, the first to kind of get a little bit popular again with it. And then and, isn't there like a Kiesel, a Keisel or something like that? Yeah, also? these days, yeah. these guys are incredibly uh, popular. Yeah. I mean, if I was to buy another guitar, unless it was something like, you know, I came across some great, you know, classic, I would definitely still go with the headless for sure. Just because of just smaller, man, it's just easier to lug around. That yeah, would be it sure is con convenient. 
Yeah. yeah. And the look, I, I guess I'm used to the look after all these years. So, <laughs> well, I definitely got used to it as well. But yeah, I did finally make a switch. But I think that was, well, long story short, that was also just hand in hand with a switch of styles, of switch of bands. And Which you switched big time. Yeah, exactly. I, I kind of did that consciously. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, 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 um, I was watching something of yours or, or something, and you were saying that it was you. You completely went different direction into mu into song composition, mm. which, um, by the way, you have a gift definitely in the song composition and even in the commercial side of it, which I think is a lot harder than the technical stuff. Um, that last video that I saw of yours, just the song was absolutely beautifully written. It was appropriate. You know, the, the spacing was appropriate and bro, your vocals are <laughs> killing it, man. They're killing it. So thank you so, very yeah, much. I, I definitely noticed a huge change in your style. What, what kind of, I mean, I, I understand. And for me, I, I definitely like to play in different styles. Metal just, comes out and that's where I seem to be, of course, you know, known from, but, um, what led to your complete change? Hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, it wasn't really planned. It was, you know, when that our ocean, the first, our oceans album was something that I wanted to do for a while, the kind of a more softer, um, I, th I think maybe similar reasons as to you guys doing Portal back in the day, just like change of scenery, trying something else. But it was, I don't know about you guys, but with Our Oceans, it was really just, uh, it was meant as a one time off kind of experiment. And, and also for that reason, I didn't attach too many, I didn't make too many plans. I didn't think it out too well. You know, the, the, the demo songs I had were very rough before, even before recording was just like, ah, hey, yo, let's go, just try this. And that was also the reason why I got the Telecaster because I always loved that guitar, just the look of it. And, but I never thought it was appropriate, you know, for the style of music I played. But then I was right. like, well, I'm doing this record, you know, let's order just a semi kind of not super expensive uh, online, didn't even try it, you know, just order it online from a store and whatever. And then through just that whole process of, of just recording these songs and using that guitar, and then, well, that was even back then, it was the idea that a friend of mine would sing like uh, a female with female vocals. That didn't work out. So then I tried that myself. So it was all the, all, all of these kind of happy coincidences, you know, falling together. And Believe through that, I just discovered, you know, that I kind of really love doing that and kind of love doing it more than what I was doing previously, you know? I, well, yeah. I, I do hear the difference between your first album and the newer stuff that you have coming out. And it makes sense as to what you were saying that stylistically you're kind of letting things kind of flow and go. And it seems like the stuff that you're putting out now is, is extremely well thought out, you know, composed, um, hmm. music. Is, is there a different, is, in other words, like you said, is this more focused in a, in, in that direction? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was much more yeah. intentional. And um, yeah, great composition. Well, thanks, the man. I appreciate yeah, that. Which, which again, I think is so much harder in a pop commercial, you know, more uh, commercial sense than. Well, uh, but th I, th I think that you know. Well, but but that depends on what you pay attention to, because I think when I look back at, for example, the Focus record to uh, to get back to that, even though that that music is very technical. I do think the compositions are really great on that record, which is one of the main things that sets it apart. Because if I, I'm thinking like how to say this kind of somewhat nuanced, nuanced, uh, but for me as kind of uh, someone who, well, I, I place a lot of importance into composition or songwriting. And for me, if I listen to a lot, I would always, almost say like most 
modern bands that are somewhat in that technical realm my gripe is always the songwriting it, it to me it most bands just sound like they have really cool ideas and but that's it it's just cool ideas strung yeah. along you know like copy paste cool ideas and they call that a song and um, transitions man it's all about transitions i think and and i know with focus we put we we put a lot of time into it you know we'd get all these rhythms together and as a band, we would compose the song. So then you've got, you've got, you know, four guys there that are throwing different ideas and we would go, okay, let's try that one. Let's try that one. Let's try that one. And, and Reinert was just in, incredible with his, um, his composition and thinking. And he mm -hmm. was a big factor in a lot of the transitions on the focus album and, um, rhythmically and, and how to approach it that way. But, but yeah, I, I hear you. It's it's very easy to take a technical riff and stack it next to a technical riff and stack it. But you know, there, for me, you want to have a flow. There's got to be a dynamic, a push and pull yeah. to, to get a good written song. You know, for but sure. I, I do a lot of the a lot of the newer music these days. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, what's interesting also to come back to that remark of of it being maybe less of a concern or easier whatever however you want to uh, say it with with technical music for me i would almost say the opposite in terms of if you do a little bit more of a pop type structuring then you have more reliable formulas to use because you do have you know all of these formulas of just first pre-chorus chorus and then it's variations you can do um and they work so well i mean there's a reason why they're so popular because they work well well and, right. and so I use them a lot as well, but with more technical music where, for, for instance, take focus again, where you kind of break away a little bit, even though you guys did use some of those formulas, but you also broke away from that a lot. And that makes it a little, easy, uh, little harder, I would say, because you're breaking the rules. So it's not so easy to say then what works anymore, what doesn't, you, you know, you really have to pay attention then to what works and what doesn't. That's interesting because um you said it right there you're breaking the rules and i think that that in a sense for me with your pop structure is part of what's hard is mm -hmm. having the rules you know what i mean and and all that um and and in a pop song it, you know sure structure is is more simple you know and um but to write a really just piece of candy <laughs> ear candy pop music you know to come up with that riff and that idea and then compose and blend all those together and really have a it be fluid mm -hmm. um there's a there's definitely a magic to it there's a magic to it and i think it's you know you have those rules that you have to abide by but um but um yeah yeah but i can i can also see your side of it in the sense that the formula is there so it's a it could be in a sense easier and it, it's true. If you do have a good idea, and at least you do have a formula to work with, that makes it easier. But you got to come up with that pop idea. And so mm. I think, so I think people, like we talked about earlier, have a natural sound. There are some people that this just their sound is pop, or you know, or like take a band like, for example, what Nirvana. Mm. Okay, you remember those guys? I mean, huge hits. You look at what they're playing; insanely simple. Mm. But that was their sound, their natural sound, like like we all have, happened to be in that pop genre. You know what I mean? And mm. then it goes huge, you know? Yeah. Um, because they're very simple, but you listen to the songs, man, they're catchy, man. They're catchy, they and you understand why people, it was a sound that they had. So, um, so I think also players, some are naturally, I think, um, for example, you would be, I guess, more naturally inclined um, towards the pop stuff where I definitely still find myself leaning towards the more obscure, I guess, style. I think it'd be harder for me to do a pop song than, mm. than you know what I mean? It's yeah. more natural. But yeah, everybody makes sense. has their mm. natural you know, gifts. Indeed. Okay, so let me take a look at the chat again because I see a lot of it coming by, but I don't have time to read it, of course, when I'm talking to you at the same time. So let me scroll up a little bit and see if we have some other questions that we might go into. 
Well, this I'm also uh, curious about myself. So let's talk about this little uh, a little bit. This gentleman is asking about your collaboration with Santiago, and he's asking when it will be released. Um, is there a chance for here? Yeah, that's kind of the question. So let's talk about that a little bit. You, uh, I've I've also been seeing that you've been uh, over at his place and playing guitar because you share some pictures on on your socials. Um, it seems like you guys have a good good time together, for, uh, judging by yeah. the the smiles. So that's important. Absolutely great guy, and and yeah, and and just that it's fun to be. It's great to be playing with people like Santiago. He's just a wonderful person, and we we have a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, so we're doing we're doing an album together. It's it, the album's technically written. Okay, um, we're just having time constraint challenges uh, okay. with some of the players and. Um, which is kind of delaying it a little bit, but it's a, it's a fusion project. It's definitely mm. got some edge, but it's got some groove. It's, you know, it's not, um, it's definitely not a metal album, but you'll definitely hear the metal elements in there. Um, so with the delays, it's just been taking a long time. Like even we finally got, uh, the first drum track, uh, Matt Thompson from King Diamond and Agora is going to play on a couple of songs. Uh, oh, cool. I at, just saw, I think like this playthrough with uh, Steve Di DiGiorgio this morning with, uh, with Matt Thompson on drums, right? Like, or am I, oh, I didn't, I didnn't hear about that, but, um, oh, maybe I'm confusing Matt. names, but I think so. Oh, DiGiorgio. Wow. Yeah. That'd be a good combination there. Um, but, um, so we finally got the, the drum tracks and then, so, uh, you know, we're pretty ready to start cutting, but Santiago has been really busy with, uh, with work and his family. So it's kind of delayed hmm. our process. Um, but our goal was to put the album out by the end of the year. I don't think that that's going to happen the way it's going, but we've decided now that we're going to probably release it single by single. And then when the album is full, then we'll release a, you know, a CD or something like that. That way we can at least start giving, you know, some of the listeners something to listen to and uh, nice. we can do it as we go on. We, you know, looking in retrospect, we should have just done it a song by song. Um, but Santi and I, you know, ended up getting together and blazing out and we already got over an album's worth of material, you know. So And it's I nice to work like that, right? Like very yeah. concentrated when you're in the flow anyways. Yeah, but um, I want to get it recorded, you know, before you lose the spark, you know. Exactly, There's yeah when you're when you're recording music and i like to, to get it done quick so it's taking a little longer than anticipated i wish it could be a little faster you know fortunately for me um my kids are grown up you know i have a little bit more flexibility and time in my schedule so i'm the one pushing everybody and being, you know <laughs> get it done or whatever but on the same note i totally understand you know you got to yeah. take care of your family you got to take care of your life and all that but it's going to be a really cool uh, project, I think. It's going to have a lot of um, a lot of different feels, some different styles in there and edge um, already. So we've got uh, Matt Thompson. We're talking to a couple other drummers. Uh, Chris Kringle from Portal. He's going to play on. I was just going to ask who's playing yeah. bass, but okay. Yeah, he's going to play on some of it. And uh, Alan from Agora. Oh, I know um, him as well. Cool lined up to play now he's had some some issues with his you know carpal tunnel and he was going to oh, get a crap. surgery he didn't know if he was going to play so um again hence some of the the delays just in the mm. whole process with life happening with some of these people so but alan uh we're hoping to have play on on some of it nice. i'm trying to get my brother to play on one song oh fun uh, we've both been in the industry and we're kind of in different sides of the industry musically but he's a great bass player. Mm. He's more of an R&B style bass player. Um, but I gave him a song that had the most funky, groovy type stuff, you know, on there. So um, I think it'll be fun. I just always wanted to do something on a professional level with my brother. We've both mm -hmm. done stuff professionally, but never got to play together. So, <clears throat> so he'll be on there, of course, myself, Santiago. Um, I think uh, we're going to have Vishal from Amog Symphony and uh, Serpents of Patagonia. He's um, oh, he's in uh, he's a guy in India. Oh man, I'll send you a link to some of this guy's stuff. Amazing, amazing musician. What does he play? Uh, 
he's a multi-instrumentalist, uh, mostly guitar though, mostly guitar mm. drums, but you know, he's, he comes from a music family and, um, just all around super talented guy, but I think we're going to have him, he's going to guest on one of the songs, you know, at least a solo. We'd like to have a few people solo on it. Maybe even mm. if you'd like to, we can get you in on a little, uh, song, sure. get a song or something like that, you know, always fun. but, um, but yeah, so it, it should be a really cool project. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. I think that I think that the people that are familiar with my sound are going to definitely get to hear a lot of that on this project. And you're going to hear a lot of the, I guess, the cynic element that's just naturally in my sound because mm. we're not playing <laughs> as fast and as aggressive. But there is a lot of counterpunctual. There is a lot of that intertwined multi uh, uh, multi melody going on at the same type same time type stuff. So it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting fusion album, and we're trying to um, give the songs each almost a little bit of their own feel. It's not mm, really nice. tied to any uh, any style or anything like that. And of course, with having different drummers and different players, it's gonna kind of spread that out a little bit too. So, mm. so yeah, I'm really excited. I, I'm excited. The only thing that I'm, I'm challenged with is I want to get it out. I want to get recording. <laughs> yeah. I want to get playing and get moving on the project. But, um, we're going with the, the name Vedana. I, we still got to see if it's even available, but that's what we've chose so far. Um, Say that again. Vedana. Okay. Does yeah, that mean something or is it? It does. It does. And it, it, uh, it has to do with, um, feeling and, um, I'd have to Google the exact, uh, mm. definition, but it, it fits a very, uh, has to do with, I think feeling and interaction with, uh, inner and outer stimulus. And, you know, mm. so we figured, okay, that'd be like, a actually, uh, Alan Goldstein came up, uh, Oh. from Agora came up with that uh, name along with a bunch of others that we just shouldn't use because he's a really funny guy and <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice so that's what we're going with for now so so yeah figure <laughs> figure uh, we definitely hope to have a, I would love to see at least one or two maybe three songs done before the end of the year and and released yeah you know I'd like to have it all done you know within even by the end of mid next year have everything out on the on the album because again the music's there it's ready to go and and definitely i've got some other projects that i'm working on and and like i said i like it i really like to keep the music fresh when you record it and the the energy there so um but yeah very excited madonna coming out soon and very cool some good, some good stuff on there i'm very curious because you know i obviously know your style very well and I also listened a lot to that, especially the first Agora album when, when it came out. So I know uh, Santi's style also really well. But still, I'm having a little bit trouble in my head, like formulating what, what the hell would come out of that co collaboration. So I'm curious. Yeah, it's interesting because we are completely different players, you know, completely mm. different players, um, completely different mindset, completely different education. Now, he's your educated player. Yeah. He breaks down everything, understands the theory. He help. He actually gives me lessons and helps me freshen up and, you know, <laughs> Fun. Give me some uh, stuff to play with all the time. But, um, but he is more of an improvisational player, you know, and like his solos are all improv. And, mm. and then when you look at, um, you even see it in his Agora playing and all that. His rhythms are almost solo-like as well, in a sense of not as much chordal structure as to a lot of, I don't know what you would call it, polyrhythmic movement, or you know, like just uh, which just leans with his um, improv and soloing ability. Me mm. myself, I don't. I'm not a shredder. Not a fast player. Never found myself to be to be that. And it's funny when I pick up a guitar. I naturally, I like composition. I like writing music. That's my joy in music. And um, so when I pick up a guitar, I, I'm playing rhythms and playing chords and ideas and all that. Santi picks up a guitar and he, just, he starts soloing, you know, it's like that's yeah. his gig. So it's been interesting because we're totally different and how we write is totally different, but it's working. It's working quite interestingly well. Um, 
our styles, which we didn't know how that was going to be, you know. Um, so originally, my plan was to do this project with Sean Reiner. I was going to ask that, like uh, how how that would have been if he was still with us. This this is actually how how Santi and I got together. Was um, I hadn't talked to Santi in many years, you know, and so I was uh, I took a trip to Asia for a year, and I was coming back to the states, so it was closer to fly into California. So I called up Sean. I said, "Hey, I'm coming in." He said, "Come stay a week with me, you know, and let's jam and hang out." So. We got together and we jammed and we hung out and um, that's, we decided, okay, let's do this project, you know, mm -hmm. and there was, um, um, that was the original plan. So I stayed there for a week. I went back to Miami for about three months. Him and I were talking and about a week before I was going to move to Sean's house. I was going to mo go move to California I was going to live there for six months, a year or whatever. And we were going to do this project, him and I together. Mm. And we were also going to do the cynic documentary together mm. as well. He was going to help me with some of the scoring and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and yeah, like, like a, a week and a half before, you know, uh, he passed and, uh, and it didn't happen. So, um, of course went out to the, to the memorial and to, to be with uh, his family and his husband and all that. And Santi came as well. Mm. And that we reconnected after so many years and it's like, bro, we're in Miami, we're together. And you know, it's just, just a week, week or so after Sean's memorial, we got together and started working on it, you know? So, <laughs> but yeah, but the, the original, uh, idea was with Sean was going to be the first one, uh, project I was going to do. And hence <clears throat> what happened, you know? Yeah, sad. Um, sad. Yeah, I remember also, I don't know if uh, you told me or whether Sean told me, but I was aware of those plans, yeah. And um, yeah, I would have well, been incredibly... You were part of the consideration, if you know, of, of players, you know, that we were thinking would be great for the project. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's what I remember Sean also saying, yeah. So that that would have been incredibly cool to to explore, especially because, as you said somewhere earlier in the conversation, it's like Sean. Uh, it was clear that he well, he also studied composition, right? Because I was going to say like he indeed always had such a good idea about um, about the whole song structure and academic. vibe. And he was very academic. He, from my understanding, he when he he started on piano or or whatever and. He wanted to play drums, and his mom got him a drum pad. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's how. That's how. He, okay, you want to play drums? Play this, and yeah. then I'll get you. And he, <clears throat> you know what? And he's very academic. He took lessons, and from there went to like a snare, and then finally went to the whole set. He kind of had to prove himself uh, to his mom because his mom actually is was a principal. Well, I'm sure you probably know, but um, she was a principal for a uh, a school. So she was very academically inclined. His father, from my understanding, worked uh, out uh, in like marine biology or whatever. I don't remember exactly mm, what, but I know I he was know. out in the Keys actually at one point um, working out in the ocean and all that. So, mm. so Sean comes from really academic, you know, educated stock. And um, so he started that way. And then he got into New World School of Music, which is a kind of a music and art school here in Miami. Mm -hmm. So that's where he went to high school. So yeah, he's, he's definitely, and then from there he went to Miami Dade. Uh, he went to the college when we went to college as a band, us three went to college, uh, at least Sean Paul and I. And, uh, and from there he went to university of Miami from my understanding. So yeah, yeah. he, he definitely understood and, uh, knew music way better than, than actually most of the guys in the, in the band. Yeah, exactly. Lone was a, I think he was a PhD in music composition or something like that. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, and then to me, what I always found like kind of curious is that, like, even in, um, or you know, I know obviously Sean best from the period when I played with Cynic, and it was um, at least back then it was very clear that Paul was the one who came up with most of the ideas, and then. 
Sean was more of almost the producer, if you will, besides being the drummer, of course, you know. But I was always really curious what would come out if Sean would come up with the compositions, you know. And well, and interesting, interesting. Um, Sean did do some some compositions, not necessarily in focus, but he was he was also playing keyboards and you know your Kit Kat stuff and all that mm -hmm. uh, creepy stuff that he used to do. And he had, um, gosh, he, he had an interesting sound. He had a really almost somewhat commercial but orchestrated classical sound to his style. It was very interesting, some of the stuff that he used to write. And mm. it didn't necessarily apply to what we were doing in, in Cynic when, when I was you know, working with Sean. But that was his the point. I think that was his musical release to get away from the heavy stuff. So he mm. specifically wrote, you know, stuff that really wasn't going to work. But yeah, <laughs> he could have contributed. The guy, you know, the guy definitely, and he had a, a very unique sound. Every time he wrote something, it was it was definitely it's like, oh shit, that's definitely Sean Sean's piece, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I. Yeah, and I mean the the one track that and you you ended up playing a little guest solo on that as well. Um, so that that happened a couple of uh, sorry, broken eggshell. Yeah. Kit. So that happened a couple of years ago when um, it was born out of an idea that that Sean mailed me. He wanted to. He had I think some kind of new endorsement deal with with. Tama, I think, and they were gonna. I, I don't know if they actually did that, but he had his own snare, I think, going like an artist series, and he was going to do some kind of a video demonstration of that. And for that, he wrote like a little piece, and and so he he wrote like the the synthesizers and just the, the basic composition, very short song, like a couple minutes. And uh, and then he sent me all the tracks and was like, can you do whatever, you know, like, can you complete the song, basically, just do whatever. And, That's uh, how the song was born. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And then, yeah, and so then it l laid on the shelf for a couple of years because that was just right before Sean got kind of into that kind of legal thing with Paul about the cynic name and, you know, um, so that came kind of in between and so it was shelved. And then after Sean passed, I was like, well, that is really a shame that no one is ever going to hear that thing, you know, because I, I love I love the track. So then, yeah, yeah I thought yeah. like, OK, let's let's uh, well, first of all, ask Tom, his, his husband, if he would be OK with with me releasing it. And then right. I asked, you know, like Robin to join, and then I asked you, and we kind of made a full song out of it. But yeah, it, it leaves me, well, also just how that came about it was really fast. You know, Sean threw that thing together like in a day, and yeah, I man. did my parts in a day, and we did Robin in a day. So it was a very low-key kind of just having fun with it thing. And I remember right. also that Sean was saying that, that he, he thought that was very important also with the project with you that you were talking about, that he wanted, I think, maybe also as a reaction to the overly serious times in Cynic, he, he wanted, I think, more of a work situation where it was just about having fun, kind of lighthearted and... yeah. That was our original goal, you know, was like just to, to play and have fun. So, you know, you've, you've been in the industry, you know, the industry can be hard on the artist and, um, you know, it's not a, it, it's one industry where people really put a lot of energy and the artists in it really don't make that much money to survive on, you mm -hmm. know, or anything like that. And so it puts a really bad taste in your mouth. And that's, that's why I got out of music. That's exactly mm -hmm. why I got out because I wasn't having fun anymore. So I said, I have more fun playing guitar in my room than having to deal with the record companies and fighting all this and all that. And so, so now all that technology has changed. You don't have to deal with the record company anymore. And, and that was the thing. So Sean and I, when I came back from Asia and got together he was like, I don't know if we're even going to want to play the same style of music. We got to get in that room and we got to we got to jam, you know. And like you said, maybe it was for years, the years of both of us being so intense. We just um, went in the room and it was just you know, 
Fusion obviously came out instantly, but we were on the same page still, mm. <laughs> you know, we're like, okay, this is, you know, and we just want to have some fun grooves play and put some cool stuff out. And so that was the whole concept. And that concept has also led into the Vedana because Interesting, uh, yeah. it's the same thing. You know, I promised myself, I said, okay, if I'm going to come back and I'm going to start playing some music or do something, you know, on a professional level again, I'm only going to do it if I have fun, you know, so I'm not going to take a project, you know, that I'm not going to enjoy, even if it's a paying project. So people will send me, Hey, you want to do a solo? You want to do this? Um, sure. There are, there are friends that yes, I'll do a solo no matter what for you. You know, mm. there's no question. But if, you know, someone that I don't know, I tell them, Hey, send me the music, <laughs> at least let me hear it. And if I feel I can contribute in a positive manner to this music, then I'll play. But if I don't feel it and the energy isn't there, even for pay, I, I won't take it. You know, that's nice. uh, that's something I kind of promised myself that I would do to keep the music fun for me because the industry really took it out of me for a while. And it's been great. It's been great. I've had a couple projects that I got offered and um, and was like, wow, you know, this is really cool. Again, I mentioned a little earlier, a uh, 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 bass player and a drummer out of Germany, mm -hmm. that's Santi are playing the two guitar parts. Oh, interesting. You know, Both of you. So they, they, they are writing the song, sending me the drum and bass track. And then, um, Sante and I are writing our guitar parts over it, you know, and, mm. and going from there. Uh, but that's the one I told you was like 10, four, eight, four, 10, four, eight, four, seven, four, 10, four time signature <laughs> just all over the place or whatever. But I heard it and I'm like, okay, this is cool. This is a cool project. And so, um, so that's what I've kind of been doing. And I think also if you do that, your music's just going to be so much better and more passionate. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the whole thing with coming back. It's gotta be fun, man. You gotta have fun playing the music or it's just not, you know, for that, I'll go work a regular job mm -hmm. and I'll go feel unhappy over there so I can be happy playing my music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. For, for, you know, the money aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Also, um, what was I just thinking of? <laughs> um, the thoughts slip slip my mind. Oh yeah, um, yeah. It's it's fun to hear you, or it's not fun, but it's interesting to hear you say that you're kind of tired of that industry. Whereas for me, from my perspective, you were kind of on the tail end of the good old days when, when there was still money to be made from being an artist, you know, and. Um, in, in in what aspect do you say that though? How is it the the good old days in from your perspective? So I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, well, it it seems to have been a time where if you sold some CDs, you actually still could have maybe made some money out of it. You know, if you know what I mean. Even though well, that's, that still exists, of course, but it it kind of shifted much more toward playing live now. Well. Yes. Well, I, I do know that, that, yeah, now you have to play live and you have to just because of the digital age and people aren't doing the CDs and all that. Mm. But the other aspect of signing, you know, back, back when we signed, it was, it was a nightmare for Cynic to get signed to begin yeah. with. It was a nightmare. And then when you we did, get signed, you did end up signing with a big label though, right? Yeah, and they reluctantly signed us because of mm. playing with death and atheist and monstrosity, and there was a big buzz going on. And they mm. said, "Okay, let's." So they gave us it was it was a seven album deal. Oh, you know, shit. a seven album deal, and it wasn't the best deal. We took it to our entertainment lawyer. We gave it to him. He rewrote this. He rewrote that. We took it to Roadrunner. They looked at it. They laughed at us. They said, "Reprint it." Gave us the same contract back. They said, "That's it. That's uh, what you get." You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And then, then you're contractually tied for seven albums. And so, yes, if back in the day, if you were in a commercial pop selling part of the industry, there was a lot of money to be made with a record company. Mm -hmm. But being that we were so out of the, you know, out of the box, I guess, we never sold the amount of numbers to ever yeah, make sure. really anything even, you know, oh, wow, you're signed. Everyone, oh, cool, you're signed. 
bro, you're, you're owned by the bank. That's all signing is, is mm. you're signing a contract that they are going to fund your project and they're going to get their money back first and then they're going to give you a small percentage back. Exactly, so yeah. in, in that sense, now you can cut out the middleman or the label. Now you can record much cheaper, you know, much uh, easier, not need the full studio or everything. Um release it yourself. Yeah, you still have to play, but you can make money playing. But then if you do sell a CD, you actually get mm -hmm. more than a few pennies per CD. You know what I mean? It's you, but you have to fund it all yourself. You have to do it yeah. all yourself. Um, but to me, just having to deal with a record company contractually and being tied and all that is just, um, it really was, was a bad experience for me, you know? And then, mm -hmm. so for example, that was portal portal we came back we were like let's do something let's just try a commercial project for fun something that that could go on the radio again this was like something that could go on the radio maybe we could make money you know what i mean because we <laughs> didn't make a cent off uh focus so we came back we did the portal thing and we actually had atlantic records was shopping us and a and rep came out a couple times to see us and they were interested but we could not get released from our roadrunner contract so we lost a potential deal that could have made, you know, some money and, you know, it seems like people liked what was going on. At least Atlantic did. And, um, so yeah, it's just that whole complexity in the industry yeah. that it took away the artistic spark out, out of the play, mm. you know, and they, mm. everyone speaks to the artist. So, so yeah, I see what you're saying as far as the good old days. And yeah, man, if you were, you know, uh, you know, a big band, doing well in the good old days. Yes, you definitely made money. Um, but you had to be in the right market. Now I think you can be in more our offshoot markets that like you and I are in now mm -hmm. and possibly make a little bit, you know, I don't think it's, um, you know, necessarily enough unless you get really big to make a career out of it. But Hey, it's nice to at least get a little compensation for, for sure uh, for the work. You know, it's something we do that we love, but it's work and it's time and it's effort and mm. you know there's a lot to it also you know that uh that i think artists don't get paid for in general you know <laughs> yeah 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 it's a lousy job if you uh, look at the hours you put in and what you get out of it unless of course you uh are in a scene that's you know in a little bit more exactly. of a pop scene but uh, yeah to respond a little bit about like the whole label thing um that is I would say quite different these days for smaller artists. Be, um, just that I, you're probably not aware of this, but I uh, dabbled a little bit with and without labels. So the first Exivius album, for ex or for example, we did uh, indie, and we just well with that record we we know very we knew very little bit about releasing an album. So it was more of like just release it and see what happens. Then afterwards, we did an album and we signed with Season of Mist, so the same label um, that Cynic was signed on, uh, signed to later on. And I remember my expectations, or all of our expectations, were a little bit higher than they could really pull off the label in terms right. of just getting more reviews, getting more press, getting more action happening for the band, basically. And, and it depends on how the label views you at the time. If you're hot, they'll put the time into yeah, you. If they yeah. don't know, it's, you know, that's... Exactly. That's that's also what what you said about, like, uh, Roadrunner being kind of uh, hesitant to, to sign you guys, reluctant. That's what you get when you get a reluctant label deal. It's like you're at the bottom of the thing. They maybe throw, throw you through their system once, you know, reach out to the press contacts, and then if nothing happens, nothing happens. And better luck next time kind of thing which right. is a little right. bit of annoying if you put a lot of time in a record but at the same time it that's just business right that's how it works so there's not much you can say about that well and, and that's, that's the thing it's the um it's that same commercial you know side of it you know if, if you are in a style of music that you know can really go pop commercial or something like that and, and pick some good monies. It, it is a good thing to be in. But if you are that band that, that is playing some obscure music and is in that reluctant deal, which just seems to be where I live, <laughs> you, know, 
it never worked for me. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, the, I think one of the good things about, like, for example, with uh, our oceans now, we are signed again, but the deals just look so differently these days. For instance, right? yeah, it's like there's no like seven albums, just insanity when I hear that. You know, now it's just for two or three albums at the most. And it's also like licensing is very normal now. So and even between, for example, that Exivius record and then now the Our Oceans record, the licensing time they own the masters for is has been con uh, getting considerably shorter. So now the masters are only being owned for seven years, seven and a half years or, or so in the, in the deal we have, which is super short. Interesting. That is super short. Yeah. But then in return, you also d don't simply don't get that much in return, you know? So right, right, in ter in and, terms. and and with those album deals, uh, what is the funding like? You know, is it do you, you negotiate and they give you a certain amount? Same thing, old school style for your budget and your recording budget, and same. But, but uh, the con you know, if you would compare that to like the old school way of what advances were back then, it's nothing these days. It's uh, not even a tenth of it. You know. I'd be very interested to see that. And I don't want to ask you on a live uh, video to, you know, say how much you got for your budget or whatever. But funny, I have my Cynic contract still. I have my Roadrunner contract. Nice. I'm I, also like, I never, I think I never discussed that with the guys. So I'm also curious what Roadrunner did. Like, I know what season gave us like for, uh, for Trace and Air, for example, which was still a lot like at the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, for Focus, I think our budget was 24000 Oh, interesting. Uh, 24000 and then we ended up needing like another five or 6000 in studio time. Mm. And I mean, that was eaten up. That was like blazing those songs out in the studio. And with all the material that we had, actually, you know how when you block a studio, you can block it for your eight-hour blocks. You know, you block it for the whole day. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott Burns would block us for an eight-hour block. And that would be paid, but he'd stay another six hours with us, still recording at night for free. Oh, nice. To, to make it happen because it was so much material and so much to do in such a tight budget, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. It would be fun. Maybe, maybe not a good one for us to do live on a video, but I would love to compare <laughs> contracts one day and see, uh, yeah. you know, because then we could see the difference. I would be very curious to yeah. see how the contracts look also. Yeah, let's talk uh, about that later. Indeed, offline, I'm I'm pretty open <laughs> about these things, but I don't know who else would like mind who's involved with these contracts. So let's in, indeed exactly. keep that maybe That's under wraps. <laughs> That's the same here. Cool. Um, by the way, let me know if you're running out of time, right? Like because I have all the time in the world here. I put all the time. I put <clears throat> left it open, so I'm good. Good. Much, nice. Uh, much time as we need. Nice. Well, let me again dive into ch into the chat here a little bit see if we get some interesting questions coming up thanks to the video of focus in studio that jason uploaded i'm relearning to play euroborg forms it's a really tricky song <laughs> yeah fun song yeah, to play was... always the aggressive one i remember i yeah, love that, that. Was, yeah, that was... That one got at it, that's for sure. Yeah. It's one thing that will ever, forever stay with me. Like the when I joined Cynic and we would play these older songs from the Focus days, I would have this ability to still kind of listen to it, like perceive it as a fan, even though I was on stage, you know? So I would like look into the audience and think like, yeah, you know, I know exactly how cool this is for you guys. It was oh, such a wow. cool, you know, such an interesting experience because that is interesting. It's, yeah, because if, if it's a band that you like and you end up getting to play with them, you know, in, in a sense, you were you you were on the other side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Actually, it, actually, it was actually quite a trip for me watching you guys play. I bet music that I wrote live. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that was really um, that was an interesting dynamic to see. You know, I enjoyed <laughs> it. It was mm -hmm. very cool. Be, but uh yeah it's different that's different I, I i got to stand on the outside on yeah. that one yeah yeah interesting um let's see what else we see here we chatted after a lewisville show blah 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 
cool, cool, cool. Yeah. I always think of our oceans as portal from Cynic. Yeah, that's indeed kind of a logical. Uh, a similar switch. Similar switch. Someone is asking if you have any footage from the portal area. Like, do you? Like some video material? Very little. Very little. For some reason. Um, so, so I videotaped everything. You know, I documented everything back in the day. The videography aspect of it is not there. I mean, it would be like in the studio, I would set up the camera and I would just let it run. So I right now have about a hundred hours of footage and that is mixed, you know, from, um, from studio to tour to, you know, in between stuff. And I did have some portal, but I basically, I had two boxes of eight millimeter tapes. <clears throat> I lost a whole one mm. somewhere. I sent it. I sent it at one point. I sent. I wasn't able to do the video or to to do a documentary. And Reiner, uh, I'm sorry, Malone was interested in in doing it, and he was getting into Final Cut Pro and all this stuff. And I'm like, bro, I sent him the videos, um, so he had them for a while, hmm. and then that didn't work out. And Sean and Paul were going to give it a try, so they took the videos, they digitized them, but somewhere in that loop, a whole box, a whole half of my footage got lost. Mm. And understand, I still have about 100 hours of footage. So I'm figuring at least 50 hours of actual, you know, because a lot of it's junk and waste <laughs> of time, you know, video. So what I have now, I have gone through and I have digitized. I, I'm ready to go into that stage. It's just such a big project. But, um, but I have very little portal. So I think what I had... <laughs> From portal was probably in that other box that got, mm. got lost. Yeah, and so, none of the other guys digitized it before it got lost, or correct. Well, but correct. You, like, we don't know, know where it got mm. lost. We don't know in between who, mm. what happened. But when they digitized it, it was already down to the one box. I was like, "Where's the okay. other box?" The box, you know. And um, so, but there's still there's dude, there's so much footage and. Just the fact that the Focus album has taken a, um, you know, taken on a cult kind of classic type deal. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I really want to put out for the fans, you know. Something and they I would love that. I, I, I actually remember like this topic coming up like over the years, like many, many times, like like way early on, like back when I think even back when the band didn't get oh, reunited. And trying for Years, so yeah. so there's the cost. So think about the cost it takes uh, one to do it. Now now there's hope here, but but hear me out. So now this many years later, and every time we did it, it had already been 10, 10, 15 years. You know, now it's twenty five years. But now I would like to not only I need to go through all that footage, but I want to go back and re-interview. You know, a lot mm. of people from that era, Tea Garden, Choi, Masvidal. You know. Um, um, people that were in the other bands that they played with, you know, whether it's atheist or um, <laughs> some of the monstrosity guys, you know, and, and just, you know, Santiago from Agora was here in the whole Miami scene as it went on. And like, so mm, he must still, have been young then, right? Huh, he was young. He was like 15, 16 when I met him and was yeah, cool. already spreading at that age. Bro. <laughs> I remember looking at him going, this guy's going to kill it, man, you know, yeah, but nice. So it's a lot of footage to get together and to get so so I finally got the footage digitized. So now it's a process. Santiago has a uh, videographer or a video editing guy that actually works at the television station that that he works at mm. that is willing to do it. So my next deal is to sit down with him and actually ask him how do you do this whole because it's like a storyline you have to have your theme your topic it's a lot to cover sure. it's a really big project um and i am going to get it done and i'm getting closer but i need a professional's help i realized there's no way it's something that you know could be yeah, done to pull it off well 
Have so you thought of like uh, did, as, have you thought of like crowdfunding this? Because I th think you might get quite some funds together for that. So I, I have actually. Chris Kringle had thought about that. He hmm. he said, you know, that's an idea and an option. So I have thought about it, but then I didn't I, I didn't know if people really would. Uh, would participate in it, you know, or donate mm -hmm. to it. And then, for example, you know, uh, a very, very good friend of mine, uh, Erwin Quinto in the Philippines, I had just posted is having some kidney failure and, you know, he's having some issues that he's fighting for his health and, mm -hmm. and all that. And I feel like those are, are things that people should be donating to, you know, I <laughs> sure, feel, yeah. to be honest, to ask the fans to help me pay for a, a video that, I would love to give to them. You know, I would absolutely yeah. love this not for me. I've seen the footage. I was there. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of people really um, would love to see, you know, how that whole process was in the studio and how the process was on tour and the dynamics between everybody. And there's just some funny stuff on there that I'd love to share. So, um, but I have thought about that. I don't know. I mean, I guess if people are commenting on the chat or anything like that, I would love some feedback. If that's something that people think would be worth me uh, doing, because that is another challenge for me. is it, It's not an inexpensive project to do, you know? Exactly, because, especially if you want to include those interviews and everything and get people involved who can help you uh, in a proper way. That's not going to be I, free. Yeah, it's a big project. So, yeah, yeah. I'd love to get some feedback if anybody uh, has any out cool, there. Cool, cool. Um, let me see if we get some questions, got some questions here again. Yep. Yeah. Some people are saying, uh, that they would definitely contribute. Well, I bet they would. Yeah. I, I mean, we tried it once with our oceans and once with Exivius. And I think, um, the key with that type of stuff is just getting, um, getting the right ratio between giving the people actually something they want and make you know communicating properly that you actually do need their help you know and and making but but you know making clear that it's not a it's not a donation it's actually they're just like pre paying something like pre-ordering something in a sense right 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 Right. Because, you know, it's something that, um, you know, it's not even something I'm really worried about monetizing in any way. You mm. know, it's something I just I would love to just give to the, yeah. to the fans to be able to do that. So. Um, so, yeah, if it was something that did get out and there was funding like that, it definitely wouldn't go in my pocket. You know, it would definitely <laughs> be going in, in to pay for that uh, for mm -hmm. that video. But. I'll get it out either way, some way. But yeah, I would be interested if people think that's a good idea to fund, crowdfund it. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you something completely different, um, a little bit outside of the music thing. You mentioned that you uh, travel through, um, well, multiple countries, right? If I'm right. Yeah, so, yeah. How how was that whole experience? I mean, I kind of followed you here and there just on your socials again. So I saw a lot of uh, pictures coming by of your trip, and it looked like a really nice experience. It was and it was life changing. It was life changing. So was it so, something so, you always wanted to do and just finally did? Or yeah, it was it was something I had always wanted to do. It was something I had actually had planned and wanted to do. I, you know, I, I I had the opportunity to see Europe when I was touring. You know, I got mm. to see a lot of Europe. I got to see a lot of U.S. Being here in Miami, I've got to do a lot of Latin countries. You know, in Mexico and Cuba and the Caribbean and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but Asia has always been fascinating to me, you know, and, and I've always been a fan of martial arts too. And just, you know, different styles of uh, martial arts, which, you know, is part of Asia too and Asian food. And, um, so what happened was, was, um, I ended up, I ended up getting a divorce, you know, and so we had, uh, I got a divorce, sold my house, you know, we split everything. Um, so all of a sudden I didn't have a home. You know, I had some money in my pocket. I had a little bit of time and I said, you know what, this is the one time I can actually take this trip and, and, uh, and do this. 
so I mean, it took a few months. I mean, I, to plan it and to get everything set up before I left, uh, you know, the states. And my kids actually, my daughter was like, "Listen, my uh, my work just called me. They said I have three weeks of vacation that I need to take before the end of the year. So I'm going to Asia with you." She said. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, "All right." Well, and at the same time, my son uh, was in between. He just graduated from high school and had summer break before he was going to head into college. And um, so I said, then you're going too. So they actually started the trip with me. And I said to my daughter, I said, if you're going to go with me and start this trip. So I had planned this trip was one year, almost to the day that I that I did it. Um, So I said, if you're going to start the trip with me, you can just tell me where you want to go. We'll start there and I'll just continue my journey from there. So she wanted to go to Vietnam. So my, myself and my two kids actually flew into Vietnam, south of Vietnam, bought three motorcycles and drove all the way across the country, all the way up to the north of Vietnam. And that was my first month in Asia. And mm-hmm. then from there, my kids, you know, went back and work in school and, and, um, and they gave me their, their blessing. You know, I told them, listen, are you okay with this? And they, they definitely gave me their blessing. And, you know, with technology, I talked to them, all the time. And, you know, I said, if there's anything, I'm back in 36 hours, you know, since I always had enough to come back, there's never an issue. So I basically backpacked across Asia for a year, man. I did, um, I did Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Philippines. Um, I I got around a bit and it was just Mm. an Absolutely amazing experience. One thing to experience those, those those countries. Another thing to travel alone in countries where there's a huge language barrier. China was was an ex- insane experience. Um, actually, an American friend came out of the woodworks, you know, fellow musician, and saved me in China and made it possible for me to actually continue um, my travels through China. But doing it alone was an amazing. <coughs> experience I think you learn so much about yourself and you just you're just forced to go engage with people you know mm-hmm. when you travel with a group you really don't engage with the people around you you know so um, in that process I met some absolutely amazing people saw some amazing places if I could go to see you know whether a shrine a temple a museum a anything if it was within two hours I would walk there you know mm-hmm. what I mean and so I could see everything. And then then living for a year with only what you can carry on your back. That's yeah. another experience. You know, that's it was a very interesting experience. But I met some wonderful, absolutely wonderful people, met the love of my life again. I, I, I've got a beautiful gal that uh, that I met on my travels. And is she um, uh, is she with you in the U.S. now or is she still living over there? We're, actually, hmm. we're in the process. We're in the process. The whole COVID thing screwed yeah. us up. Right. The whole COVID thing screwed us up and we're waiting for the borders uh, to open back up. And then uh, and I've already talked to uh, uh, an immigration lawyer and all that and the whole process of that. But um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping before the end of this year, she's she's here or we're you uh, know. very cool. How long have, have you guys not seen each other now? It's been over a year. It's almost yeah, even tricky. going on. Yeah, going on. Uh, yeah, over, almost two years in a sense now. Because, yeah. But it's funny. I, I talk to her. It's like we have a schedule. I talk to her every day. We video chat mm. in the morning, and it's the only thing I can't do is give her a hug or see her. But yeah. um, we were actually laughing the other day because we were putting the timeline together and how long we've been dealing with this because of the whole COVID thing. And it hasn't seemed that long. We have such a great relationship and such a great, you know, it's definitely, you know, uh, 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 there's the physical aspect of any relationship, which is always amazing, but there's so much more as well. So, um, so we're going strong and, um, I am excited to, to get her here. I'm probably going to head over there first and see how, how the process is going to work to bring her back. But, um, but yeah, she's, she's in the Philippines, she's in Manila. Mm. Uh, Kaina is her name, but, um, but yeah, so her and I met and then we ended up traveling. So she ended up traveling with me, probably traveling with me, probably four months, 
of the trip. Mm. She bounced around and met me in a couple places. And then I spent probably two and a half months in the Philippines. And she traveled with me around there as well. And we met through um, a mutual musician friend. Mm. And just it wasn't, you know, wasn't planned or anything. It was It's a mutual uh, musician friend. Uh, my friend in need, uh, Irwin, right now was one of them. Uh, Yarden Angeles was another uh, great friend I made in the Philippines. And Shekinah is one of their friends. So when I went to the Philippines, they were like, hey, let's travel around. They offered to take me to see the hanging coffins and um, <laughs> some of the rolling rice fields and all that. Well, she went on the trip with us, and that's how we met. Mm. And so those two guys were married. So if we had to ride on a bus and it was two seats and two seats, they sat together and I sat with her. Mm. You know, we had to share a hotel room. You know, her and I shared the hotel room and they shared a hotel room. So we just got to know each other and just, you know, it was purely plutonic for, for months before uh, we just couldn't deny the fact that we both wanted, you know, wanted more. So. Um, yeah, beautiful gal, absolutely love her to death and, and very happy and excited to get her here, but, uh, back to the trip. So, so yeah, I met her and met some absolutely amazing people, had some amazing experience. And that's what actually got me back into music. Timon was my, my trip. So I went out, I had no idea what was going to happen. I would look and check the, the cost into a, into a country, you know, visa requirements, whatever I would get there. You have to book one hotel or Airbnb has to be booked when you enter the country they, they you have to have somewhere to go so I would book that and from there I'd walk outside and look my fear which way is the wind blowing okay I guess I'm going that way and I would just walk the country you know and I'd spend uh, I would take a usually the full visa spectrum in each country so mm. I'd spend a few weeks to a month and you didn't uh, plan ahead what what countries you went to it was just go with the flow just go for it, you know? So Man, then awesome. that's how I ended up in the Philippines and back to my thing with the music. So I started to travel and I would post, Hey, you know, I'm going to, to Thailand, you know? And, uh, I made a couple great friends in Thailand, you know, um, guru and Sergey, man, love to you guys. Um, <laughs> you know, but it was the music. They contacted me and they said, Hey, you know, I, I know your music, whatever you're here in Thailand, you know, can I show you around or can we get together? Well, this started happening as I was traveling throughout all these countries. And I didn't realize that Focus had gone, gotten that far out into the world or gotten mm -hmm. that much. But uh, the music world opened their arms to me. And people in almost every country either offered to take me in, offered to show me around. You know, I definitely had times where I was in countries where I didn't have any contact with people. And it was um, it was amazing. When I got lonely, it seems like all these people would just show up. And then when mm. it was like, I need space, I'd end up out in the middle of nowhere in, in Cambodia, you know, I, like I, Cambodia, I did completely alone and Cambodian jungle and all that. So you could take a tour to go see, you know, see Siam Reap and go see Angkor Wat and go see all these places. But Angkor Wat is one temple amongst like 50, just in that region that are the same thing. They're the same way. So you could take a tour and pay a ton of money and be rushed all through it. Or like me, I just would, I rented a scooter and I drove through the jungle myself. I got a freaking map. I drove straight through the jungle and I went, I'd get up at sunrise and I went from, and it was like, bro, it was like Tomb Raider, you know, like uh, <laughs> right. Indiana Jones style stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I would go out and hit all these temples just by myself, uh, driving through the jungle of Cambodia and, you know, Cambodia, I absolutely loved. The only thing I didn't like was the police there. So if you paid ten dollars a day for your scooter, you figured ten to fifteen in bribes just to get anywhere because they stop you if they see you, you know, and you have to bribe them to get by. But um, but still, the experience was absolutely amazing. So I had times where I was completely alone in like crazy places, and then I had times where I was just surrounded with love by people like the Philippines. Um, the Filipino culture in general was, was the, the, the culture out of all of the places I went that really embraced me. And I really mm. made some, um, some wonderful friends and, um, and again, it was all these musicians. So in the Philippines, they actually held an event. So I'm in, I'm in Thailand. I get an email or a message 
from Jordan, good friend now. And he says, hey, I heard you're traveling through Asia. Are you planning on coming to the Philippines? Well, I have a Filipina stepmother and two Filipina sisters as well. Mm. So definitely was on my list to go see their country. And uh, he says, I said, yeah. He goes, well, look, I'm a travel agent. So if you're going other places, I can actually help you with stuff, which was great. They helped me get my China visa, visa for China. And um, and he says, so why don't you, you know, come visit or, or whatever. And I said, great, I'll do that. And then he goes, would you like to do a show, <laughs> you know, or whatever? And I'm like, I haven't played in 15 years, you know, consistently. I've just played here and there. Long story short, they put a whole event for me, man. There was like four or five bands that played music from Cynic, from uh, Monstrosity. You know, they played um, Portal. They they, <laughs> they uh, even did a song from Portal. A beautiful gal, uh, Gwen, sang little little 12 year old I think at the time 12 13 year old gal sang and did a great job and it was it was crazy it was such an honor for me I didn't realize that people even you know I mean I know focus kind of got around and kind of became a somewhat of a metal classic but I didn't realize how much mm. so they put this whole event on 100 200 people came out and to to see me and you know I ended up just uh improving a little bit at the end uh on how could I because I hadn't played in so long. These guys played my stuff like you better than, than I did uh, <laughs> yeah. when I was there. So, but it was that community and just the, all the musicians that really uh, came out to me on this trip and opened their, their homes, their, their arms, you know, took me places. And it was all over the place that this happened. Too many to, to mention. I wish I could mention all the friends. But um so it was just like music was calling me, was calling me, was calling me, was calling me. And it's like I just came back and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for fun. And it's funny. As soon as I got back, I started playing. You were the first project I worked on was mm. the, the solo that I did with you. But it's come back with a vengeance for me and the passion is there and I'm enjoying it, you know, and I'm back to where I was um, when I started playing music in the sense that I'm really enjoying it now, but that, that trip and that experience in Asia, actually, I, it's almost like I went there and reconnected with myself, you know, and, and yeah. through life, kids, marriage, all that, you end up putting so much into your kid's life and worrying about raising them. So then I was divorced. My kids are, are both grown and got busy lives. And it's like, I forgot who I was and what I enjoyed mm. and what, things was music you know so in that trip it all came back so it was an amazing experience i mean if, if you or anybody gets a chance to travel and travel alone at least for a month i'd say take that experience it's it's life-changing for you you know especially into yeah. uh, throw yourself into a different country and go for it it's a, it's a life-changing experience Ah, uh, that's really nice to hear, man. And um, I figured as much just, you know, following you on the sidelines a little bit. Like, I th I thought, like, uh, well, first of all, I just guessed that happened with uh, with your wife and that you uh, separated. And that, that was kind of the, maybe the kickstart you needed to do this, go on this adventure. But I also mm -hmm. figured, like, this yeah. whole falling back in love with music thing just happened there. Because I saw, like, the event you were talking about, um... I saw, yeah, I saw the, those things just come by, uh, you know, and uh, it was interesting to see. And um, yeah, it was yeah, an amazing. Experience. I definitely want to do that trip as well. Um, I I have traveled alone also quite a bit, but my first kind of uh, attraction was more towards South America. So I traveled through Chile and uh, Venezuela, and. Um, especially Chile, a lot of my own also alone. And um, and I had some, some similar experiences as you, you did uh, as oh, far okay. as um, as also oh. just, yeah, as reaching out to, to some people who, who know the music. And, um, and they reached out to you and, and contacted you and while you're exactly, traveling? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Isn't that blessing, and, man? It, it was awesome. Um, it, 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 I, I'm sure you also had that experience of those I remember like one event we did, uh, we kind of organized something around the city in, in Santiago itself, where multiple people came out that didn't know each other. They just had, you know, they all loved, well, I, I think it was mostly Cynic fans. And um, 
a little you know super awesome but it felt a little bit like weird in the sense like that you know all of a sudden you are the person that like connects these people together it's like oh yeah what, what the hell and um, but yeah what, what a what a trip that apparently the the music like you said it travels and to some extent it, it it seems even that it because you know those bands never get a chance to play in in those very far away countries so it, it for, for them it's even like more special i guess in a sense to uh to interact with with people who made the music and all that right right and, and it was funny it was interesting in in asia too a lot of people thought that i was like um a very successful financially successful yeah. You know what I mean? Musician. I found that as well. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, they, they thought I, I, I probably lived good, you know, and better than, you know, a lot of people. And it's not the, not the case, you know, I never really yeah. made money off music, but it was very interesting, that perspective. Um, but yeah, mind blowing and just an honor when you to go yeah. to someone's country and someone, you know, reaches out to you and wants to, to actually meet you. And and that's where I, I saw all the best sites. That's where I ate all the best food. You know what I mean? Was with the uh, the actual locals. So um, again, any of any any of my friends watching, thank you again. It was life changing to go and have that experience. Yeah, it's definitely Asia is on my to do list. We uh, as what was supposed to be the last cynic show that I played was in India, and uh, I don't know if you if if if, if you followed that by by any chance but we were like hired to play on this pretty big festival there but we oh, wait, had... wait, 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 wait 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 okay hold on now hold on <laughs> you know that the, the story from reiner door i spent some time in india and i actually met some guys that that reached out to me as well same mm -hmm. thing wonderful guys now was this a show that you guys went all the way to india but you didn't play yeah me and robin ended up going but paul and sean couldn't get their uh, visas so oh. they they didn't go but yeah did some guys recognize you on the street and start talking to you oh yeah for sure that was those a, were my friends a... that i had met or <laughs> some of those guys were a couple i'd met a couple of those guys that told me that story when i was wow. visiting them yeah small world huh <laughs> yeah yeah, that's crazy. And how long did you guys stay in India? Not long at all. It was like three days, I think. Oh, I did three months. Yeah, yeah that's a better <laughs> that's a better deal. Incredible experience, incredible country. That that was the most culture shock country for me, you know, yeah. as far as everything going on was but it was absolutely one of the best uh uh experiences for sure. I bet. Yeah, we with Exivius, we went back later to play a show and we actually did end up play a show. And we didn't go for that long either then. I also had just a couple of days. But, and what, um, what India was it that you, you guys played in? or um, what? It's that, well, with, with Cynic, it was in Goa. But Goa? With, okay. Yeah, but, and, and with Exivius, it was this... Uh, Bangalore, I think. Bangalore, however Bangalore. you pronounce okay, it. Okay, that's what I was going to say, because the guys that told me that story, I was going to ask. It was in mm. Bangalore. Ah. Okay, yeah. That was a fun town. That was a fun town. I enjoyed Bangalore. <laughs> yeah, what an odd experience talking about culture shock. You know, like that gig we played there was just long story short like or just one of the, some of the highlights were like us in our hotel getting to the festival side with all our gear like on those little uh tuk tuks what what do they call those yeah, little yeah, open cars they, you know yeah it's different and tuk tuks is what they call it in uh thailand what do they call them in india i, I don't uh, remember yeah me neither right now but uh yeah, just going against traffic on the wrong side of the road, full uh, all the apps packed on those little cars. And yeah. then mostly just, you know, <laughs> having trouble just getting paid, you know, like it was kind of a sketchy organization and they kind of up front, they, when we got asked, you know, we, we one of the first things we said, like, of course, we're, we, we'd love to come, but we're, we're going to ask to get paid up front, you know, like just transfer the money and then we'll come over. But every time it was some excuse after another, like, yeah, we can do it now. Something went wrong here. We'll pay you when you land at the airport. And then, of course, that didn't happen. And then at the day when we were supposed to play, um, we were suppo supposed to play at seven or something at night. 
and it didn't happen, didn't happen. And yeah, at some point, I was we were just like, well, we're gonna just have to give them an ultimatum or, or say like we're not gonna play without the money we'll because otherwise pay. we're not gonna get it. And uh, so ultimately, <laughs> it was so, so so much of a hassle to get it, but we did get it, and then we played it like eleven at night or something, <laughs> and uh, wow. and it was fun. <laughs> well, that's, that's, India worked like no other country. It was very yeah. interesting to see how things work there. And <laughs> my experience in India was um, one of the experiences was uh, it, it's very time consuming. Mm. The traffic there is insane, you know, depending on the city that, that you're in. And it's just very cumbersome and long, you know, like if you needed to buy something, you would go to buy something, not like mm. here we can go buy different things. You know what I mean? Cause it's mm. more e easy to get to, or, you know, but, um, but yeah, incredible, um, uh, incredible culture, but very, very different, you know, it runs different over there than, than I would th assume you're used to from Europe or from me from the U S right. Yeah. 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 I have a lot of friends also who traveled there. My sister is also one of those girls who, uh, took her summer vacations, you know, and just traveled alone through those type of countries. And uh, Robin, our bass player, also traveled, like he did a similar tra trip as to uh, the, the one that you did, like, but for half half a year um, with yeah. his girlfriend. So I got a lot of these uh, very nice stories with pictures and everything. So I also got to do it at some point. Got it, and the food, bro, the food. Oh my God, so good. So no. good over there. And as I, you I travel, love Asian food. It's such a big country too. As you travel throughout it, the food changes. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah. Definitely one to do. It's gonna be a little tricky with uh, because I follow a vegan diet, so I'm not sure how the hell I would put up with that on such a big travel. But you know, in certain parts of Asia, it could be. It could be pretty hard at times, you know, but in India, it, easy, you know, I mean, pure in India. Well, well, for example, I was in India for three months and never took one bite of meat. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know I what know I mean? It's part of their so, culture, like in certain areas to to have a more okay. vegetarian style. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. so big there. Now, between vegetarian and, and you said you're vegan. Yeah. So you're hard. Poor, bro. You're, <laughs> a little bit. No, theory, no mm. nothing like that either. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that just being vegan traveling anywhere is a challenge. Yeah, for sure. I would, I would also not sure how I would handle that anyways. Um, I'm not one of those very militant style vegans. And that's not to say that I, you know, that I cheat on the diet if you're, well, to use like a right. loaded word, but like well, if I would maybe travel, I would th think a little bit more, you know, don't, because otherwise you're just going to make it impossible for yourself probably. In, in it would be hard. And, and two also, I, I, I understand the whole vegetarian and, and vegan thing and all that, but too, if you're traveling to these crazy places and you, you want to experience their culture, the culture is food, you know? So, yeah. so to be a little more open to eat, uh, a little bit more would make it easier, you know, but, mm -hmm. but my, my girlfriend is vegetarian, strict, mm. strict vegetarian. You know, I, I'm, I'm primarily vegetarian. You know, I take a bite here or there if it's something really good, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I do the same, but, um, I call her side dish. Cause I mean, that's what she would get half the time when we were traveling. Yeah. It was like, okay. I, I can get a little bit of rice. I can get some beans and a salad, you know, because they didn't have an actual <laughs> vegetarian meal. <laughs> and she's strict. She's strict with her vegetarianism. So uh, um, it can be challenging. It can be challenging. Okay, well, I think uh, we've been talking for almost two hours. So maybe we should slowly uh, bring it to an end. I can see if we uh, if I can spot some interesting questions here. Yeah, Still. Yeah. Oh, someone is asking uh, if uh, I understand uh, Spanish. We're probably bored some people, but 
Yeah, well, what I found with these, you know, I've, I've really just personally fell in love with this whole podcasting format over the years, you know, and I don't know if you watch like Joe Rogan and those type of things yourself or some I do some but not I, I don't follow too much. Yeah, it's what's interesting just to see that people apparently do have the attention span to to listen to conversations even three, four hour long sometimes. Wow. And wow. maybe not in one sitting, but people can always pause and just continue listening okay. at some other point, right? Um, yeah, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this. I find it interesting to listen to conversations, but also to have them, of, of course. Right. Well, I've really enjoyed it. Good. Yeah, me too, man. It was really nice to, to see you again. And, uh, yeah. Even if it's virtual. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was going to respond, by the way, that we're also in a similar spot with uh, a little bit with the, with the relationship wise, because my uh, my girl lives in uh, Barcelona in Spain, which, oh, okay. you know, which is still a little bit easier, uh, uh, more, more closer than all the way uh, in, in yeah. uh, the Philippines. But we did have that. Uh, similar annoying period of having to wait to see each other with, due to the whole COVID thing as well, of course. It's been a challenge. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. been a challenge. And I feel bad, you know, lots of people have been separated from family and loved ones, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully so, all that stuff is uh, starting to kind of get better now. Or I hope so. Seems so. Okay, man. Then uh, let's is leave that it at this. No other questions there on the chatter. We're good to go. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, well thank great, you. Man. Thank you very much again for being my first guest. Really cool. And I wish you yeah. all the luck with uh, with the project. What's the name again? Vedana. Okay. Yeah. Vedana. And I, like I said, I've got a couple other really cool projects, but I'm not at liberty to, to give out the info yet. So. Yeah. If you want me to uh, leave some uh, or, or mention some links where people can find you, you, you're free to do so. But you can also tell me and then I will put them in the video description. Yeah. And I really don't have anything. It's funny. Social media has been pretty much the way everyone seems to, to, yeah. to look at. So I just put everything on my Facebook musician or my personal Facebook page. And um, anybody's welcome. I'm, I'm really not that strict on you know, adding friends or whatever. I'm always open. And, uh, most of the people on the page are music or somewhat related. So I just post everything there. And I, I do have a website, but it's not set up yet. I actually have the domain and everything. And, mm. and I do intend, I would like to be able to do that, um, to not only to, to put the music up for sale or, you know, uh, merchandise and other things. So that's in the process as well. But as of right now, I, I don't have anything. Well, maybe when it all gets released, we can uh, add some uh, some of those links yeah. anyway. If people watch this uh, this thing later, they can find the links then. There we go. There oh, cool. we go. Then um, thank you so much. Uh, so good to to talk to you. Like I said, it's been a long time, and you look good, man. You 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 look really good. I know you're running and you're you're staying pretty healthy and all that. So. I am, um, but you too, by the way, and thank you. But you too, right? And like, I, I think you also lost some weight over the past couple of years. Yeah, I, I lost some weight. You know, I, I uh, was doing jujitsu, and it's gotten a little complicated. I haven't been able to do it as much uh, recently. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you got to try and stay healthy, man. You know, that's, yeah, right. That's it's, nothing uh, if, without your health. I agree. All right. Thanks uh, for all the people tuning in and asking questions and taking the time to listen to our long conversation. Yeah. Thank all the fans and thank you for the for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. My first live. Video. And mine too. Yeah. So, yeah. That's awesome. Cool. So we'll have to do it again sometime. Maybe in another. I don't know. Year or two, or when some some new stuff comes out to talk about. Fully. You know. Yeah, I'm and, I'm totally on board with that. Let's do that. And, and, Talk is huge, you know, and we'll, uh, <laughs> by that time, I'm sure. Yeah. How do you sing? Tim, Tim Talk? I guess I just came up with that name, you know, it's yeah, uh, no, I whatever. It. I think it's actually very catchy. It's very <laughs> Good. catchy. <laughs> Good. Very cool. So, okay, my friend. Well, thank you for the time. And uh, thank, thank all the fans that, that watched. And uh, until next time. All right.